Good evening, everyone. My name is Muriel, and I work over on the second floor in the Language, Literature, and Fine Arts Department. Welcome to the second in the A-List author series, thanks to the Canada Council. We're so delighted to have Linwood Barclay here with us this evening to talk about his new novel, Far From True. Linwood Barclay is an internationally best-selling author of 14 novels, including Broken Promise, the first of three linked novels about Promise Falls, a fictional and rather creepy upstate New York town. <laughs> Broken Promise is currently on the Globe and Mail's Canadian fiction bestseller list, and the story continues in Far From True. Far From True not only received a starred review from Publishers Weekly, which described it as an excellent sequel, but it made its debut recently on the Globe and Mail's Canadian fiction bestseller list at number one. <laughs> when he was 16, Linwood Barclay got his first newspaper job at the Peterborough Examiner, and in 1981, he joined the Toronto Star, becoming the paper's humor columnist in 1993. I remember reading his columns. Linwood Barclay retired from this position in 2008 to work exclusively on his books. His first standalone thriller was No Time for Goodbye, Goodbye and was a great international success. It has been sold around the world and it has been translated into nearly 30 languages. Several of Linwood Barclay's novels have been optioned for film and television, and Trust Your Eyes was even the object of a film rights bidding war between Universal and Warner Brothers. <laughs> this is hardly surprising when, as Publishers Weekly said, Linwood Barclay's knack for realistic characterizations makes each person, even the nasty ones, stand out. And I certainly agree, and please welcome Linwood Barclay. Thanks for that. Uh, what a pleasure to be here. We, just, we got here a little while ago, and they, and they said that uh, there's, a, there's a good crowd in there. And I said, are they rowdy? <laughs> Is it like a Trump event? <laughs> and I said, no, they seem okay. Um, so it's really it's lovely to be here. It's, it's, you know, this, is always the, uh, this is always the huge fear when you're an author, when you're touring around for your book, is that with, will anybody show up for your event? Um, because we've all, you know, authors all have these great stories of events they've been to where nobody came or, or whatever. And, and I've discovered over, over the years that the only thing worse than no one coming to your event is one person coming to your event. <laughs> Because just nobody comes, just like, well, you know, let's go to the bar. We would just go. If one person comes, it's like, well, what do you do? You know. So the what I've the the strategy I adopt when that happens is I'm I just hope that they have not seen the author photo. <laughs> and then I sit in the audience with them, maybe one row behind, two over. And then about 10 minutes after the event is supposed to start, I say, well, I don't think he's coming. <laughs> and then they're gone, and then everything's fine. Um, but I just, I just finished doing a bit of a, um, a Canadian tour. We went, I was out to Victoria and Vancouver and Calgary, and then I'm back here, and I'm, and I'm doing a few things in Ontario. And the most exciting thing about the whole tour was the float plane ride from Victoria to Vancouver. Because it was, you know, the hotel was about a, a block from the wharf where you catch this float plane and seats about 12 people. And the festival organizer, I was going to this thing in Vancouver, he said, if they cancels your flight, I said, why would they do that? They said, well, there's gale force winds and their lights are out in Vancouver. And I oh, geez. So I went down to, went, I, walk, I, you know, I walked down to the ferry or to, this, to the wharf where the planes leave from with my bag. And I said... Is, it was 10 o'clock. I said, is the 1040 plane going to go? And they said, well, yeah, in fact, they just lifted the, the, you know, the, the ban on flying, and a lot of the other flights that were canceled or delayed, one of them's going now. You can get on that plane. I said, great. So I got on that one, and we were about to take off, and, and the pilot said, there might be you know, a little turbulence. It was like flying on a trampoline. <laughs> like, when you get turbulence in a jet, it's a bit like this, but this was... It was the scariest thing ever. And, and there, were, there were two women and one other guy on the plane. And I thought, don't let me be the one that throws up. I don't want, <laughs> I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to, and it was like, and, we're getting, and it's like only a 20 minute flight and I keep looking at my watch. Oh my God, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it. And, and I made it, and, and, uh, but it was pretty terrifying. Um, but, uh, but this is really nice. It's funny, um, 
mention was made about you know the, the Star column. It, it's actually been, I couldn't believe it, it's been 10 years since I was, did my column at the Star. And uh, I stopped writing it, I guess it was around, well, it was around 2006, and I had, I had done four comic mystery novels, four comic thrillers, which I wrote at the same time that I was doing three columns a week for the Star. And collectively, those four books sold about, I don't know, 85 copies or something. <laughs> and, and so then I wrote uh, a, a standalone, non-series, non-funny thriller, a book called No Time for Goodbye. And, and all of a sudden we started selling that big time. We sold it in Germany and the UK. And I thought, well, I can take, I'll take a year's leave of absence from the star because I had to, to write another book. Because I was finding that writing a novel a year and three columns a week was kind of killing me. So I took the year to do that. And during that year, decided not to go back to doing the column because the books were starting to take off. And that was a really really difficult decision, not just because I really loved that job, but I had a dental plan. Now, <laughs> who quits a job with a dental plan, you know? But it was a really tough, it was a really, I loved that, that job I had at the Star. And a lot of people would say to me, well, how was it, how, what was the transition like? Like, how did you go from writing three newspaper columns a week to writing books where you just make everything up? And I thought, you weren't reading the column that closely. Because, <laughs> you know, it's all, it was, I mean, the, I mean, half of them were, maybe a third of them were sort of funny things that happened at home, and, and the other, maybe another third were political satire and so forth. And the sat satirical ones, of course, you were just making it all up, just, it was kind of a 600 word political cartoon. And of course, people would get, you know, like when you write a political satire, there's, there's about half your audience loves it, and the other half want to come down to the newsroom and kill you. And I remember one time I got an email, I can't remember what the column was, but it was some political column. And a guy wrote to me and he said, uh, he sent me an email and he said, how can the Toronto Star justify cutting down trees and turning them into newsprint to publish the kind of crap that you write? <laughs> so I wrote him back. <laughs> and I said, uh, I share your concern. I am so appalled that the Toronto Star continues to publish my column that I have canceled my subscription. <laughs> and the best, then he wrote back, he said, well, thank you for your honesty. <laughs> it was always tricky to write a satirical column, you know, because, you, you know, there was, there would always, unless you have a big banner on it that said, this is satire, there's always someone who's going to believe that it's true. And like one time, remember when that Russian satellite years ago was orbiting, still orbiting the Earth, and it was in terrible disrepair, and it was a mess. And I wrote a column of things, things to do with your, for your kids, places to send your kids on the March break. And I said, why not send your kids to Mir Space Station Camp, the Russian satellite? But if you do, dress your kids really warmly, and send them with lots of duct tape, because the whole thing's falling apart. There might be cracks in the hull and stuff like that. I swear to God, a guy phoned me at the paper the next day. He said, you didn't put in a phone number. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you love to be his kid, you know? <laughs> Guess where you're going, you know? What was the other, the other time it was, God, there were so many, oh, I know, there was another time I wrote, uh, I, was, I wrote a piece out of frustration with all of the, the weekend and, and week road closings, you know, like the gardener and the forest, like lanes closed, you know, I just couldn't take it anymore, so I wrote a piece that was a list of fictitious, outrageous weekend road closings that in a million years no one would ever think were true. And I, one of them was, don't use, on Sunday afternoon between noon and three, don't use the westbound lanes of the 401 between the Don Valley and Islington. Because they're repaving one of the runways at Pearson. And they're gonna use that stretch to bring in 747s. I said, if you, if you happen to be on the road at that time, if you have a sunroof, leave it open. If you see landing gear, pull the hell over. A woman sent me an email, said, is it this weekend? You know. I don't know. Um, but I was, it was a lot of fun doing that. I had a great time doing that gig, and it was a really tough, it was quite seriously, dental plan aside, 
was a very tough job to give up. But the thing was that, you know, and people talk about, well, was this a difficult transition from going to columns to, to writing uh, uh, books? Books was what I always wanted to do. I was writing novels when I was in my teens and in my 20s. I was writing crime novels, and I was sending them off to publishers, and, and they were sending them back just as fast. <laughs> and, I, you know, and nobody wanted to publish my books, and I think that we can all be grateful for that. Uh, apparently, they weren't interested in publishing terrible novels, which I thought, you know, I have not seen that as a major impediment to a lot of writers, but still, <laughs> where I was concerned, they were drawing the line. So I thought, well, where can you get paid money to write every day? And I thought, well, why not go work at a newspaper? And the first one I worked at was the Peterborough Examiner. And, uh, and I had, a, you know, I went there without any experience at all. And, and, uh, and it was a great place to learn. And then I worked at the Oakville Journal Record, a small paper in Oakville, and then it went out of business. And then I went to the Toronto Star in 81. So I did all this time in newspapers, but writing novels was what I had always wanted to do. And so I'm just finally getting back to what the plan was when I was 15 or 16. Uh, but I had a good time. Actually, the Peterborough Examiner was an interesting place. It was at the time owned by the Thompson newspaper chain. And they were what you would call a, th a thrifty organization. Some might say cheap. We were, we had, we did not have a standard equipment on the paper, what you might consider, uh, you know, to be standard equipment on every newspaper. We had proofreading on kind of a sporadic basis. And I remember one time, I was there for what was the greatest typographical error in the history of Canadian journalism. We had a local band called Dino and the Capris. And everybody knew Dino and the Capris. They played every bar and wedding and whatever it was. You'd drive past the hotel. Dino and the Capris this weekend, you know, in, in Felon Falls or Ennismore. You'd always see them around. So for us, it was a front page entertainment news story when the band broke up. Above the fold, page one, picture, the whole thing. And the story read, first paragraph read, after 25 years of playing weekend dates in local hotels, Dino is tired and wants to spend more time with his family. All right. Not a great lead, but adequate. But because we didn't have any proofreaders engaged fully that day, somehow nobody noticed that the letter P was missing from the word playing. <laughs> so in case you missed it, <laughs> after 25 years of laying weekend dates in local hotels, Dino is tired. <laughs> wants to spend more time with his family. I was surprised the family would have him, frankly. <laughs> anyway, I had, a, I had a good time there. And, and so I did this whole newspaper thing. But I, like I said, I always wanted to write books. And I wrote these four uh, sort of comic thrillers. And then I wrote a novel called No Time for Goodbye, which kind of went supernova. Um, it changed my whole life, that book. It was funny. I had. Uh, when I, I had done these four funny thrillers, and they didn't sell very well, and my agent said, you, should, you need to switch gears. You need to go in a different direction. You need to write a standalone thriller. It needs to be dark, and it needs a great hook, you know, something that grabs you right away. And so I kept trying to think, well, what would be a great hook? And I would send her one idea, and she'd write back, and she'd say, I've read that before. And, and then one morning, I, one morning, I wake up at 5 in the morning, and there's an idea kind of there, whole, which is a 14-year-old girl. She's out drinking with this older boy. She comes home. She gets in a lot of trouble with her parents. She goes to bed. She passes out. And when she wakes up the next morning, the family's gone. Her mother's gone. Her father's gone. Her brother, they're gone. And 25 years go by, and she's never known what happened to her family. Did they... Would, did somebody come and, and take them away and kill them all and somehow miss her that night? Or did they decide to leave and not take her with them? And which would be worse? Would it be worse to find out that everyone in your family was dead or that they were alive and didn't want you? So I emailed her this idea at 8.30 in the morning. The phone rang almost instantly. She said, that's it. That's a fantastic hook for a thriller. And because she's the agent and kind of my editor, she, she likes to know everything. She says, what happened to the family? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't a clue what happened to the family. She said, don't worry, you'll figure that out. And so that book, that book became, the, among other things, became the single best-selling novel of the entire year in, the, in, in 2008 in the UK. It's done several million copies since then. And so things kind of been going all right. But ever since then, I've been doing basically a standalone thriller a year, and I was thinking, well, how can I kind of 
step that up a bit and do something a little more challenging, a little bit different. And I started thinking about, what if I wrote three linked thrillers? Something that, that was basically a trilogy, but the first book would kind of be standalone, and the second book would have a sort of standalone story. But in books one and two, there's this building backstory that would, in the third book, completely explode. And I started thinking about that, and typically I write a book every 12 months. I'm on a book a year schedule, because that's kind of what, when you're writing thrillers, when you're writing this kind of fiction, everybody wants their new Lee Child in July, or their new Michael Connelly in September, or whatever it is. So they want, there's an expectation that there'll be a book a year. So I write every 12 months, I do a book. But doing a trilogy, I thought, well, what if I get to book three, and I think of something great that has to be set up in book one? And they get really annoyed at chapters if you go in and take books off the shelves and edit them, you know. <laughs> and it's time consuming, you know. So I wrote them back to back. I wrote all three books in 15 months. And it just about killed me. I was pretty bugger bugger by the end of it. But, uh, but that's what I did. And it worked. It was a good thing to do because it kept the flow going. And in fact, there were things, even little things that I changed in book one by the time I, that after I'd finished book three. I had just enough time to fix it as it was getting ready to go to press. So book one came out last summer. And of course, this is the other thing. So I had this great plan that if I wrote all three books in 15 months, I could basically take two years off, <laughs> which was a thrill to my wife, Nitha, that had me sitting around just doing nothing for two years. That, but I thought this would be great. And so, but now that the books are all finished, my publishers all went, well, this is great. With a trilogy and a continuing story, we can compress the release schedule. And so all three of them will be out within a year and a half. And I said, nuts. But that's what they decided to do. So, so like, like I say, last summer was the last August was book one. Book two came out a couple of weeks ago, and book three, which is called the Twenty Three, will be out in November, about the third week or so. So, I thought what I would do is read a little bit from uh, book two, Far From True. First, I thought I would read the entire first chapter. I see looks of panic. But I'm going to, because I tried, I was going to try to trim it down, uh, but I really couldn't. It's one of the, you know how authors are, like every word is sacred, how dare you edit me. So I've read, so here's, here's chap, chapter one. They ain't seen nothing yet. Now. <laughs> I could read a little of chapter two. So chapter two, so instead of reading chapter two out of the book, what I did was when I, when I was going to be flying out, you know, everywhere, I didn't want to have to lug a big, heavy book around. And so, they, you know, they send you these advanced review copies of the, of the book that are kind of a, a lesser, cheaper version. And I thought, well, I got an idea. So I took an X-Acto knife and I cut out the first chapter, stapled it together. And then I went through and thought, well, people, I don't want to read the whole thing. So I went through and I started making notes, scratching out the parts that you don't have to read. And I wouldn't read to an audience because it's, you know, and, and I thought, after all my years as an editor, because I was an editor at the Toronto Star long before I was a columnist. I was an editor there for 12 years. I was assistant city editor, news editor, I was life section editor, all those sort of things. And all this editing experience tells me, well, if I don't need this now, why is it in the book in the first place? <laughs> you know, the thing is that now, I, you know what I love? I love Twitter. I just love Twitter. So whenever I have an idea now, because it's sometimes, you know, the column was a great outlet. Like if Bell Canada screwed something up for you, I could write a column about them, you know? And it was an outlet. And, uh, and now I don't have this outlet. So I go on to Twitter, and in a 440, I sort of do a whole column idea in 140 characters on Twitter. And, and I find I can do it, and I think, wow, those columns were really padded. <laughs> if I could have done them in 140 characters. Anyway, I'm going to read a little bit of chapter two. They decided Derek was the one who should get into the trunk. Before heading off, the four of them, Derek Cutter included, thought it would be cool to sub smuggle someone in, not because they couldn't afford a fourth ticket. That wasn't the issue. They just felt the situation demanded it of them. It was the sort of thing you were supposed to do. After all, this was the last night they'd ever have the chance. Like so many other businesses in and around Promise Falls these days, the Constellation Drive-In Theater was packing it in. What with multiplexes, 3D, DVDs, movies you could download at home and watch in seconds, why go to a drive-in, except for maybe to make out? 
And given how much smaller cars were these days, well, that wasn't so easy either. Still, even for people of Derek's generation, there was something nostalgic about a drive-in. He could remember his parents bringing him here for the first time when he was eight or nine and how excited he'd been. It was a triple bill, the movies becoming successively more mature. The first one was one of the Toy Story flicks. Derek had brought along his Buzz Lightyear and Woody action figures, which was followed by some rom-com Matthew McConaughey thing back when he was only doing crap. And then a Jason Bourne movie. Derek had barely managed to stay awake until the end of Toy Story. His parents had made a bed for him in the back seat so he could zonk out when they watched features two and three. Derek longed for those times when his parents were still together. This night, the constellation was showing one of those dumber than dumb Transformers movies where alien robots inhabiting Earth had disguised themselves as cars. Morphing from car to robot involved a slew of special effects. Lots of things blew up. Buildings were destroyed. It was the kind of movie none of the girls they knew were interested in seeing. And even though the, girl, the guys tried to make them understand the movie itself didn't matter, that this was an event. It was the last night for this drive-in. They had failed to win them over. Which led to a discussion that they should try to sneak in not only a person into the drive-in, but some beer, too. Thing was, this was a milestone piled on top of a milestone. This, the last night for the Constellation, uh, it was also the end of the academic year at Thackeray College, which Derek had been attending for four years and was now leaving. Anyway, Derek has been sort of thinking about all these things in his head for a while, just kind of wrapped up in his own thoughts. When the other guys who are going with him say, hello, Derek, are you there? And he goes, what? It was Canton Schultz who was talking to him. He was standing next to his four-door Nissan with the driver's door open. Flanking him were Derek's other friends from Thackeray, George Lidecker and Tyler Gross. We just took a vote, Tyler said. What? Well, while you were in La La Land daydreaming, we took a vote, said George, and you're it. I'm what? You're the one who's going to get into the trunk. There's no way, I don't want to do that. I don't want to get in the trunk. Well, that's too bad. We've been standing around here talking about it. And you had nothing to say, so we made a decision. The thing is, it's a very important job, being the guy in the trunk. You're the one who's protecting the beer. <laughs> Fine, but I'm not getting in now. When we get close to the drive-in, I'll get in the back. Derek was not a fan of confined spaces. But he wasn't a fan of looking like a wuss either, which was why he'd proposed getting in just before they arrived at the drive-in. Everyone agreed that was reasonable. So after putting a case of beer into the trunk, they piled into the car, Canton behind the wheel, George shotgun, and Derek and Tyler in the back seat. Derek didn't know when he'd see any of them again. Canton and Tyler would be heading home to Pittsburgh and Bangor, respectively. George Lidecker, like Derek, was a local, but Derek didn't see himself hanging out with George. Derek was remind, reminded of a phrase his own grandfather used to say about people like George. He's not wrapped too tight. The words that came to mind for Derek were loose cannon. George was always the one who acted first, thought later, like turning over a professor's smart car and leaving it on its roof, slipping a baby alligator from a pet shop into Thackeray Pound, Pond. That little guy still hadn't been found. George even boasted about breaking into people's garages late at night, not just to help himself to a set of tools or a bicycle, but just for the pure thrill of it. As if George could read Derek's thoughts at that moment in the car, he decided to do something monumentally stupid. George dropped the passenger window, allowing cool night air to blow in as they sped down a country road that ran around the south end of Promise Falls. Next thing Derek knew, George had his arm extended out the window. There was a loud bang, and an instantaneous ping. Jesus, Derek said, what the hell was that? George brought his arm back in, turned around in the seat and grinned. He showed off the gun in his hand. Just shooting at some signs, he said. Really nailed that one. Are you out of your mind, Can shattered? What are you doing? Put it away, Derek said, you asshole. George grimaced. Come on, lighten up. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, well, where did you get that? Did you steal that out of someone's garage, Tyler asked. He said, it's mine, okay, it's no big deal. I figured I could take a couple of shots at the screen tonight. I mean, they're going to be knocking it down in a week or two anyway. It's the last night. Who cares if it's got a couple of holes in it? Are you really that stupid, Canton asked. Really? You're unbelievable, Tyler said. Okay, 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 George said, lowering the weapon, resting it in his lap. I wouldn't really have done that. I mean, I wanted, I wanted to shoot some signs, maybe a mailbox. I mean, I'm not an idiot. 
there was some disagreement on that point. So they traveled a few more minutes in silence. It was Cannon who broke, it, broke the silence and said, how about here? Here what, Tyler said. This is a good spot, no one's around. Derek, this is where you get in the trunk. Oh, we're still doing this, he said, this is just stupid. No, come on, man, it's tradition. That's what it is. When you go to a drive-in, you, you smuggle someone in. It's expected. If you don't do it, the management's disappointed in you. <laughs> so Derek gets into the trunk. Car pulls over. Derek gets in. And uh, Derek's relieved to see, like a lot of the cars have now, that there's a lever inside the trunk that you can pull to get out if you have to, if there's an emergency. So Derek gets in the back and uh, drops his butt in first. And... and uh, the way they go. He noticed, with, as I say, he noticed with some relief the emergency lever is in there. And he got his head in and then he brought up his legs. He lay on his side, the case of beer tucked behind his knees. Okay, so don't start screaming or anything, Canton said, and slammed the lid shut. It was nearly pitch black in there, save for some red glow from the back side of the taillights. Derek felt the car veer back onto the pavement and then pick up speed. Despite the rear seat between him and his friends, he could hear them talking. Just everyone be cool, Canton said. Yeah, Tyler said, like I'm going to say, we got nothing in the trunk. I'm not an idiot, not like George. Okay, here we go, said. Geez, there's still a line to get in. It's only like 10 cars. It won't take long. Derek struggled to get comfortable. He hoped it wouldn't take them long to buy tickets and get parked. He knew it was his imagination, but he felt as though he were running out of air that he was having trouble breathing. His heartbeat was moving into second gear. He felt the Nissan turn. Canton would be pulling up to the gate where there were two ticket booths. Right beyond them, towering over them, in fact, would be the backside of the four-story screen. The car stopped, inched forward, stopped, inched forward. Finally, Derek could hear Canton shout, three tickets, please. Then, not quite so clearly, a man's voice, just the three? Oh, yeah, yeah, just, just us, just the three. Ten bucks each. There you go. A brief pause, then the man's voice again. You're sure it's just the three of you? Yeah, yeah, just us, yeah, yeah. George says, can't you count? Shit, Derek thought. What the hell's wrong with him? The man selling tickets said, and you guys know, there's no booze allowed. You can't be bringing anything in like that. Oh, of course, Canton said. There was another pause. I'm going to have to ask you boys to pop the trunk. Sorry, Canton said. Trunk, pop it. And Derek thinks, shit, shit, shit. Well, what was the worst that could happen? I mean, uh, once they found him in the trunk well, with the beer, well, they could do one of three things. You know, they could deny them entry, or he could charge Derek another 10 bucks, maybe confiscate, confiscate the beer. I mean, the last thing, surely they wouldn't call the cops about something like this. I mean, come on, really. At this point... Derek didn't much care. Right now, he'd happily endure a full body cavity search if it meant getting the hell out of here. Canton said, I don't think you have the right to do that, sir. Oh, yeah, the man said. Well, yeah, I, I don't think you have the authority. You're just some dick selling tickets. Yeah, well, my name's Lionel Grayson. I'm the owner and manager of this place. If you don't pop that trunk, I'm calling the cops. Well, maybe it's more likely than I thought, Derek thinks. Okay, then, Canton said. Derek heard the driver's door open. Then another door on the other side of the car. Tyler had been sitting behind Canton, which meant George must be getting out. Tyler said, George, what are you? Derek didn't hear the rest as both doors slammed shut. Canton was saying, you know, this being the last night you guys are even open, we were just wanting to have a little fun, and the man, this Mr. Grayson, sounding closer now, said, just open it up. Okay, I hear you, I hear you. But then he hears George. You know, man, this is America. You think being a fucking ticket seller gives you the right to violate our constitutional rights, huh? George, just let it go. No, now all three voices are at the back of the car. Derek was still pretty sure Grayson wouldn't call the cops. He'd just tell them to piss off, turn the car around, send them on their way. Derek already had a plan. They'd go back to his place, download a Transformers movie to the flat screen, get drunk sitting on the couch. No need for him to be the designated, designated driver any, and then they hear bang. The biggest bang you can imagine. No, it was more than that. 
so much more than just a bang. In the trunk, it sounded to Derek like a sonic boom. The whole car seemed to shake. It couldn't have been something on the screen, one of the transformer robots blowing up, for example. You had to be in the car. You had to have the radio tuned to the right frequency to hear the movie. And even if this had been a regular movie in a theater, the bang was too loud. It sounded really close. George. Could he really have been that dumb? Had he gotten out of the car with the gun? Had he started waving it at the manager? Had he pulled the trigger? This stupid, stupid, stupid son of a bitch. Surely to God, he didn't think getting caught over something like this was caused to shoot a guy. There were screams, lots of screams, but they sounded off in the distance. Jesus, someone shouted. Derek was pretty sure it was Canton. Then, oh my God, that sounded a lot like George. Derek frantically patted the back wall of the trunk, looking for the emergency release. His heart was pounding. He'd broken out in an instant sweat. He found the lever, grabbed hold, and yanked. The trunk lid swung open. Canton was there. George was there. So was the third man. A black man, Derek figured, was Lionel Grayson, the manager. Not one of them was looking into the trunk. In fact, all three had their backs to Derek, their collective attention focused elsewhere. Derek sat up quickly, so quickly, that he banged his head on the edge of the opening. He instinctively put his hand on the injury, but he was too spellbound to feel any pain. He could scarcely believe what he was seeing. The Constellation Drive-In Theater's four-story screen was coming down. Dark smoke billowed from the width of its base as it slowly pitched forward in the direction of the parking lot as though being blown over by a mighty wind, except there was no wind. The immense wall came down with a great whomping crash that shook the ground beneath them. Clouds of smoke and dust billowed skyward from beyond the fence. There was a moment of stunned silence, barely a second, then a strangled symphony of car alarms whooping and screeching in a discordant chorus of panic, and more screams, many, many more screams. So, that's... So, it is at this point that I take, I am instructed to take questions from the audience if anyone has any questions. Um, but anyway, that's, that's kind of what's, what's what the, the backstory that's kind of going along through, through books one and two is there's been all these really weird things happening in Promise Falls. There's this in, this, in the second book, it's the screen coming down. In book one, somebody find, they find 23 dead squirrels strung up from a fence. Uh, one night, a, for, a Ferris wheel at an out of business theme park on the outskirts of town, one night, in complete darkness, the Ferris wheel lights up and starts spinning around. And when they go to check it, they find in one of the carriages, a carriage marked number 23, they find three mannequins with a message painted on them that says, you'll be sorry. And so these things are kind of going on in the background while our other stories are carrying on in the foreground. Yes, question. Why are none of your books uh, set in Canada? Well, if, they, if I set them in Canada and these people were so horrible, you would not believe it. Canadians just aren't that bad. Uh, I don't know, but particularly in some of the last couple of books, very much a theme of the novels has been, the, the backdrop has been a very, very depressed, terrible economy. And the economy down there was much worse than it was here. And it kind of plays into a lot of the plot lines that I've been working on. Yes? I'd like to know what happened to your kids. Did you All right, what happened to the kids? Actually, I should have repeated that first question, but anyway. But, but the question this was, uh, what happened to the kids that I wrote about. Well, you know, so you thought there were kids, eh? <laughs> you thought I really had kids. Um, no, they're great. Spencer and Paige, who were, you know, often written about in the column. Um, Spencer uh, is 32 now. He's been married for, for uh, almost four years Lovely to a lovely girl. He's doing film work. Uh, he's doing all sorts of different things. Paige, um, when she finished school, she went, she actually, she did some cool stuff. She, um, First she went, I think it was like 10 years ago, she went to, um, to England just to prove that she could fly solo and got a job and, and lived there for several months and then came back. But then she started working at, she worked at the Gladstone Hotel for quite a few years in sort of planning events for them. But after all that, she decided she was going to go back to school. So she's back at the U of T now. 
and, uh, and, and has a partner, a wonderful guy, and uh, so that's what they're up to. It's funny, when, I, when people would say, well, how do your kids feel about being in the column? And I would say, if they ever read it, they might care. <laughs> if they never read it, they didn't care. I mean, I remember one time I wrote a column about Spencer. He borrowed his mother's car one day and took it to go to school. And I get a phone call, I work from home, right? So I, they get a phone call, and somehow, he has locked the keys in the car with the engine running. <laughs> and I don't even know how it was possible, but he, he managed to do it. And so he said, can I come over with a spare set and get the car open? So I did, and so I wrote a piece about it. And I remember him sitting at the breakfast counter one day, and I said, the columns in the paper this day, today, about you locking the keys in the car. Do you want to read it? And he said, well, why would I read it? I was there. <laughs> like, I know what happened. So, uh, but so they're having, I'm sure they were tremendously relieved when I stopped doing the column. Uh, all the lawsuits were dropped at that point. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes? What's your writing process like? I mean, because I know being a writer, it, it takes a lot of discipline to actually sit there for hours or I'm just curious as to how, what your process is, how you follow that, how you kind of continue to Yeah, so, what's, so the question was, what's my writing process like? And um, first of all, for me, and I think this has a lot to do with having spent 30 years working in newspapers, writing is a job for me. And just as you may go to work and, every day and teach, or you may go to work and, and build houses, whatever, I go to work every day and I write a book. And so there's not this kind of element of romanticism or waiting for the muse to strike. To me, it's a job. So I get up in the morning, and when I'm in the process of writing a novel, uh, my goal is to try to get 2,000 words a day done. So if you get 2,000 words done a day, that's 10,000 a week. Uh, book's about 110,000 words. In two and a half, three months, you have a first draft. So I treat it like that. That's the way I work. And... and um, and depending on how good that first draft is will determine how much more work you do on it. I've done novels like No Time for Goodbye that first draft was pretty much what went out there. It wasn't a lot of tinkering. I've had other novels like The Accident Tap on the Window that I spent more time rewriting than I did writing the first draft. I did huge rewrites on them. And so I kind of start around 8.30 or 9 in the morning. Uh, it's a very easy commute. I go upstairs um, <laughs> and I go to work. And and there's often a lot of interruptions, and I'll wander the house if I'm kind of thinking about something, or I come down and get coffee and so forth. But I aim to get 2,000 words done a day. Sometimes I can get 2,000 words done by noon. Some days it takes till 3. I usually kind of quit by 3, because that's when Nitha will shout up that it's vodka o'clock. <laughs> uh, but that's kind of how I like to do it. And as far as the broader process, which is, you know, how do you go about even starting, um, you know, every, every writer I know, and I've gotten to know a lot of crime writers in the last few years and got to know friends with some and know them really well. And I think there's, for every writer, there's a different approach. Everybody does it a little bit differently. Some writers, like Lisa Gardner, who I know, Lisa just starts writing, sees where it goes. Um, Ian Rankin's a bit like that. Uh, Ian starts with kind of a sense of an idea of some, uh, sort of an issue, he says. And I'm told Michael Connolly kind of has every chapter figured out before he starts. And I'm sort of in the middle. I, 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 need, I need that hook. I need that story about the 14-year-old girl who wakes up one morning. I need that hook first. And once I have something like that that I really like, then I start figuring out, well, what set of circumstances brought that moment, what made it happen? And when I have a pretty good idea of that, even though the reader may not find out until the end, I kind of I start thinking, okay, and who are my characters? I'll start working. So I need that to get going first. But I can't, I'm not able to plan out the entire book before I begin. I kind of know where I want to end up. I know my beginning. I kind of know what's driving the story. But I don't see the opportunities that exist in the book until I get into it. I'll start writing some chapter and think, oh, I could do this. I mean, I, I, think, of, I think of, you know, one of the reasons I like crime novels, crime fiction, is because it's so heavily dependent on plot. And I think plot is sort of, for me, is the skeleton of the story. It's the spine that takes you from the beginning to the end. And, and so I can start here and I'm going to end up here. But as I'm going, I think, oh, I have a little diversion or I can do this or I can do that. But I'm always returning to that 
sort of spine that takes me to the end. Um, but I can have a lot of surprises and fun on the way. And a lot of times, too, I'll be writing a chapter and I think, well, what is the logical way that this chapter is going to end? And I think, is there any way to make it not be that so that there's a surprise? There's always, and sometimes, you know, I try to end every chapter on a little bit of a, a twist. It may not be a big twist, but it's even just in the way it's presented or that it's at a chapter end. I'm a kid, I'm a kid of the 60s, you know, who, who loved television, still do. And, and to me, chapter endings are like commercial breaks. A chapter ends and something needs to happen at the end of that chapter that makes you go to the next chapter. And so you don't even end in a book, you don't even have to go to the fridge, you go to the bathroom, you can just start. But, but to me, that's what those chapter endings are. This is that break at 15 minutes after, the first 15 minutes of Mannix, and then something happened. And you think, oh my God, what's gonna happen next? So that's kind of, sort of when I'm thinking about it, it's like that's the feeling I want to create, is that you need to stick around. This, you know, every chapter leads to something or there's some moment you think, oh, I got it, I have to keep going. Because the, the kind of books that I write, I think, need a, kind, a, a sense of momentum. They're, 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 they're the big rock that's starting to roll downhill and the further it gets, the faster it starts spinning. Yes? So who do I like to read? What do I read? I read so many different things. And I don't read necessarily a lot of people who do the same kind of stuff I do. Um, I read a lot of different kind of stuff. Um, I have a few favorites. And, um, but I almost hesitate to mention them because there's so many people whose works I really like. You know, even someone like someone who I'd never read until about 10 years ago was Philip Roth. And I read, I read The War Against, The Plot Against America. First thing I have is I and I thought, holy mackerel, this is amazing. I mean, this guy's got more great writing in like page one than lots of other complete novels have. So I'm, you know, I read a lot of a lot of different stuff, and uh, but of crime writers, probably my all-time favorite was Ross MacDonald, who I discovered in my teens, and you know, he wrote the Lou Archer novels, and I was obsessed with those, and to the point that I had a long correspondence with him, even had even met him and had dinner with him. And um, so, but there's a lot of them whose stuff I really like. Yes, yes. He, you know what Trump would say? Trump, get him out, Trump would say. <laughs> Guy says he hasn't read any of my books, get him out. No, all, all is forgiven. Which book, if you haven't read any of my books, what should you start with? I don't know. What you used to tell me? Which one? No Time for Goodbye is a good one, place to start, uh, I think. And I mean, with the standalone thrillers, everything since 2007, really, it doesn't really matter. Although, I wrote a novel called No Safe House two years ago, which is a kind of sequel to No Time for Goodbye seven years later. But No Time for Goodbye is not a bad place to start. Or you could start, I mean, now with Broken Promise, which is the first of the trilogy. Broken Promise does, I mean, this trilogy does feature characters from some of my other books, because I've written about Promise Falls before. Uh, there's some characters from Too Close to Home, from um, Never Look Away, and, uh, and so forth. But I'd say No Time or Broken Promise would be a good place to start. Yes? Do you ever have a problem with um, writer's block? Do I ever have a problem, sorry? Um, do I have a problem with writer's block and does it make it difficult to meet the 12 month deadline? No, um, I'll, but I'll tell you, I mean, I'll tell you why, because first of all, I don't have a choice about meeting the 12 month deadline. I've signed contracts. And that's, I find, people say, what motivates you as a writer? I say contracts. Um, <laughs> not me. So, uh, and writer's block. I mean, I always say, well, do you ever get teacher's block? You know, do you get, do you get accountant block? Uh, to me, that's, it goes back to my earlier point, which for me, writing is a job. And if you're having so-called writer's block and you're having a problem, well, you just have to work through it. You have to figure out, well, what's the problem? And, and figure it out. So if, you, so if I have a so-called writer's block, it, it means I'll, I'm still going to be writing, but maybe not typing. I'm going to be walking around. I'll go for a walk. I'll do something, and I'm trying to figure it out. And I can't afford to sort of put something aside for a long period of time because... Oh, skip days. I mean, sure. I mean, we all have days where we just 
I, whatever job we have is just not working. I mean, I find when I come back from tours, if I'm on a tour, I find the first few days back, I'm kind of out of it. Um, in fact, <laughs> today's news was unsettling on many, many levels, but for me, we're going to France Monday night, so I'm really anxious about that trip. But we're, we're going there, we're gonna be, um, only there for six days, but they're making, uh, they're making a six-part TV series based on my novel, The Accident in France, um, that will air on French TV in the fall. And so they want us to come over for the end of the shoot and to do some publicity and so forth. So I know when I come back from that, with the times, I'll be a wreck for a, a week. So I might not get a lot done then. But generally, it's like I say, I treat it like a job, and I just have to, I, I have to produce. I don't have any choice, because you think, well, you've got 12 months to do a book, but that 12 months also means, you know, three or four months first draft, two or three months maybe revisions, proofing the pages, touring, um, you know, because I do, do a few tours every year, so you really don't, I don't have a choice but to just crank it out. Yes? So the question was, uh, with regard to the part I read, if, you know, guys climbing into a trunk and hiding and how you, perhaps as a writer you write about the things that you've experienced so you know them really well. Of course, nobody asked that about the sex scenes. They just know I made them up. <laughs> yeah, that never happened to him. Um, I think a lot of what, everything that, I, that you write, you sort of draw from some personal experience. I have never done that, the, the, that specifically. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's an example of things that, that have happened to me or people I know that I ended up putting in a book. I mean, most, I mean, it's, it, like I say, a lot of it times that there might be a real event that inspires something in a story, but then you take it and you think, well, what could I do with this and twist it or change it? In, there's a reference when Derek is talking about he's not a fan of confined spaces. That's a reference actually to an earlier novel called Too Close to Home in which Derek was hiding in a basement and there was a murder in the house while he was there. And that story was actually inspired by something that our, my, my son told me. He was just saying one day, he was, this is years ago, it was like over 10 years ago, he was saying, oh yeah, he said some friends of his, they went to, so they went to their friend's house and that, their, that family was getting ready to go on a vacation. They were heading off to the airport. So this, this kid from this family, his buddies came over to wish them well and say goodbye. And as they were doing all of that, one of the friends snuck into the house and hid. So after the family left and they locked up the house and were gone to fly away to Jamaica, the friend in the house went and unlocked the door and said, we got ourselves a party house for a week. And then the people who were going away, their flight got canceled. <laughs> And he told me that story and I thought, that's really cool. What could I do with that? And, I, and, I, and that became the jumping off point for Too Close to Home. But what happens in that is, is Derek, in fact, is the kid who sneaks into the house and now he thinks he's got this great place to bring his girlfriend for a week. But, uh, and, that, and in that story, the flight got canceled and the people come back and he stays hiding in the house and then something really horrific happens. So sometimes you, you hear of a real event and you think, that's intriguing. Well, how could I take that and how could I add another twist to it and have some fun with it? Back there, the, the dark shirt guy. <laughs> wow, well, thank you. That's the night we ate dinner. <laughs> Well, yeah, so um, mentioning that Stephen King is one of my, apparently one of my fans. Um, it's funny that how that came about. We, uh, I heard, one day I heard from an editor in New York, and she said that one of her writers that she works with was a guy named Joe Hill, and he had loved my book, and his father had recommended it to him. Now, I thought, wait a minute, Joe Hill 
is actually Joe King, and he writes under another name, and his father Steve. And I thought, wait a minute. And within a week, King was doing a, a, a column for Entertainment Weekly of things that he'd read and loved, and he mentioned my novel, Never Look Away. And so we had sent him a copy, an advanced copy of Trust Your Eyes, which I still think is one of the best things I'd ever done. I love that book. And he gave us this amazing, wonderful blurb for it. And Trust Your Eyes features within that novel, it's about a guy who's obsessed with maps. And he spends his every waking moment on a website that's like Google Street View, but I called it World 360. World360.com does not exist. We even registered the domain name to protect it. It doesn't exist. So I'm reading Stephen King's novel, Dr. Sleep, the sequel to The Shining, and I get to this point where the bad guys are trying to find somebody, and instead of using Google Street View, they use World360. <laughs> and I believe the words I used were, you're shitting me, I don't know. <laughs> and actually in the most recent Stephen, in the Bizarre Bad Dreams, which is a collection of short stories, one of the characters is reading the latest Linwood Barclay novel. Um, so anyway, he's kind of, I mean, and it's mutual. I've been a fan, I mean, first, my introduction to Stephen King was going to the movie Carrie in 1976, which, wow. And, um, and so I've met him once. Um, we had a nice chat. That was after Dr. Sleep came out, and he says to me, did you catch the reference? And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, every once in a while I sort of have an exchange with him because he follows, he saw on Twitter now, he follows only 30 people on Twitter and I'm one of them. So occasionally we have a, a little back and forth if there's something, you know, but, uh, but I've only met him the one time. But to know that he likes the books is very gratifying. That's the biggest thrill for me since when I was 22 and met and had dinner with Ross MacDonald and he was kind of a mentor to me. So knowing that King likes the books is kind of, I mean, when, it, when something like that happens, you, you could ask Neetha, my wife, that I'm insufferable for days, <laughs> like, even more than usual. <laughs> yes. Yeah, back there. Um, you said that the, the first three books didn't sell well. Do you think there's... Oh, there were four. Four, sorry. <laughs> That's Neil, isn't it? Yeah. How you doing, Neil? Uh, <laughs> I know, I know, yeah. I got your message. Um, I thought, yeah, I saw that, I thought, that's Stephen Leacock, who played Stephen Leacock, anyway. Um, so comic thrillers, I think, are a tough sell. When I, when I first was writing Bad Move, the first of the four comic thrillers, um, I called the woman who became my agent, and I said, she didn't know me from anybody, and I think she read The Globe and had never even seen my column, and so I got that a lot. I'd say, what do you, say, what do, you do? I said, well, I read it for the column for the star. Oh, we get The Globe. Um, <laughs> but I said, I said to her, I'm writing a comic thriller, and I still remember what she said. She said, oh. Uh, she said, um, they don't do very, they're very hard to do, and they don't sell very well. You can probably think, how many people write comic thrillers and they do really well with them? There's Janet Ivanovich and there's Carl Hyacin, although I consider him, I've interviewed Carl, I'm, doing Car I'm interviewing Carl when he comes here this fall. To me, Carl writes great novels, satirical novels that have crimes in them. But yeah, there's, there's Hyacin, and there was this fantastic late Donald Westlake. But there's not very many who do well at it. And, and I'm not quite sure what the reason is. I think it may be that when, you're, when, you, when you make the, uh, the decision to pick up a thriller, you really want to be thrilled. You want to be scared. You want the tension. And if there's too much humor, it undercuts the tension. And so the book may be enjoyable and fun, but the suspense is diminished, I think, by the humor. And, uh, and I think that might be one of the reasons why they're not as big as, as, as successful. Yes. Way at the back, yeah. Oh, yeah. I enjoyed it very much. And I'm wondering if you've ever thought of putting together some of your Toronto Star calls as sort of a the next thing to do. Um, well, first of all, I'm thrilled. I, 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 was mentioned that I wrote a book in, in the year 2000, 16 years ago, a memoir called Last Resort, which was really a story about my coming of age years when uh, my parents bought a cottage resort in Trader Park in the Kawarthas near Bob Cajun, a place called Green Acres. Um, named long before the show. Uh, 
which was a very funny but also bittersweet story because my father died when I was 16 and I ended up basically running the family business and leaving it and le it was a very, to extricate myself from that situation was very, very difficult. Um, and so that book, uh, that book sold about 90 copies too, I think. Um, uh, although it's now downloadable, it's got had a whole new life as an ebook. Um, but as far as uh, as far as Toronto Star columns, that's a pretty tough sell to go to a publisher and say, "I want to about a book of columns." They just almost instantly go into a coma. Um, they don't. They're not big sellers. I, I think that all these years later, first of all, columns are very often pegged to news events, and so a collection of columns based on events from 1993 to 2006 would be a pretty tough sell. Uh, so I think that the likelihood of ever doing a collection of those is pretty remote. Um, you know, there's people have moved on. I mean, how many, you know, who cares? I had a lot of fun writing about Mike Harris, but it's kind of over. <laughs> yeah. So you wrote a novella called Never Saw Coming. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned, uh, so never saw it coming, and you're saying, what was the, just, uh, I didn't catch the last part. Sorry, so it was about the psychic. Yep. Well, it's funny, that story, and I'll just say that the question's about uh, a slightly shorter novel I wrote called Never Saw It Coming, which actually only came out in book form here and in the UK. It didn't come out in the US except as an ebook. But Never Saw It Coming, which is actually one of the books I had the most fun writing. It's a little, it's about 65,000 words, and my novel's usually over 100. But it was great fun to write. It is about a, a, a bogus psychic who uh, takes advantage of people who have missing loved ones and claims to have a vision of them which she's happy to reveal for a price. And she ends up trying to pull this stunt on the wrong person. And, but the thing is, that book was actually a much shorter novella even before that. I was asked a few years ago to write a 16,000 word novella for a UK literacy program and that it was aimed at reluctant readers. And so I wrote a novella called Clouded Vision. Very short book, was barely 100 pages. And, um, and, it, and that book ends more or less with, the, with what I would call the knitting needle scene. And my UK publisher thought it was such a neat little novella, they said, have you thought about turning it into a novel? So I turned it into a 65,000 word novel. And that'll be as far, that's as much as it's gonna grow. But what I did was that the, the novella, Clouded Vision, ends at a point where you could wonder, well, what on earth happened next? So I decided I'm gonna tell everything that happened the rest of that day. And so I had a lot of fun doing that. The interesting thing about that is there's um, uh, a woman named Gail Harvey, who's a very accomplished uh, Canadian director who does, directs a lot of television, Murdoch Mysteries and Heartland, and she just did this fabulous documentary on Ricky Lee Jones. And Gail, years ago, was a photographer at the Star, and I you know, knew her, and she's, at the moment, trying to see if she can make that into a film, a Canadian film, and, and, uh, and as part of the deal, I agreed to write the screenplay for it, which I did in November. So I'm hoping Never Saw It Coming gets, uh, gets a little bit of a, a life as a film here in Canada, or beyond. But it was a lot of fun to write that book. The back and the white top there, yes. How do I celebrate after I write a book? You know what I do? Seriously, I clean my desk. I do. I, I kind of tidy up the whole desk so it's sort of pristine. It's not that messy even while I write because um, I, years ago I stopped. I don't even print out my book. I just write the whole book as one massive file. I save it every day and I never print it out. And when it's done, I just email it. But the desk still gets kind of cluttered. And when, when a book is done, at least whatever draft I'm on, I just get my study looks perfect. Yeah, and I can look in there, and it just, just looking at it, I know that it's done for now. But that's about all. I mean, the thing is, I've done, I think I'm writing book 17 now. And, and in a kind of way, it kind of gets old hat. I mean, it's like, oh, yeah, I finished another one. And then I'll go, down, I'll go downstairs, and I'll say, yeah, I finished that one. Oh, okay. And that's, that's kind of it. Um, we might go out for dinner or something, but, but I really don't. It's, it's really, in some ways, it's not a time to celebrate because 
once I finish a book, then I have to send it to my editors. And I send it uh, you know, to my Canadian, my US, and my UK editors. And that's when the clock starts ticking. Will they like it? Will they hate it? I remember one time, this doesn't happen anymore because everybody talks to each other now, but I remember one time I, when I finished The Accident, I sent it to my US and my UK editors. My US editor phoned me, she said, I love it, it's just, oh, I just loved it, it's just great. And the next day my UK editor phoned me and he said, I think you need to start over. <laughs> and he was right. It was a mess, and I did a huge rewrite. That book got a lot better. Now, it's possible the US editor wanted everything the UK editor wanted, but she had a different approach. She'd say, I love it. You just have to do this, 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 and this. And he said, it stinks. You have to do this, 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 this. Um, so I find that the worst part of the whole process is waiting to, for the judgment. And I know there's a lot of authors you know, who say, Nobody edits me. That's is it. This is the book. You don't mess with it. It goes out as it is. This is, you know, you don't touch one word. And I'm not one of those writers. I wish sometimes I could get away with that. But I've, every single book that I have done has gotten way better after working with editors. Because you're so close to it, you can't maybe see what's not working. You can't even see what is working. And to have another set of eyes have somebody else say, you know what? This part's good, but it could be even better. And you start thinking, yeah, you know what? I could make that better. And so, um, so I'll, I'll not, you know, it all varies, but every book I've done has gotten better through uh, consulting with my editors. Yes? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, now that having done a trilogy, would I want to do another trilogy? And I think probably not. I'm not sure. It's hard, maybe early to say, but I, because of the nature of, of my, my nature and because of my kind of obsessive nature and my work ethic, I really felt that when you had really what and amounted to one really long novel, that I had to do it all at once. And writing the three books over 15 months was really got to be quite a grind at the end. So having a schedule where you do one every 12, I think, suits me better. But I can say that the book I'm writing now, while not part of the trilogy, follows on it. And I'm still in Promise Falls. I'm still with Detective Barry Duckworth. I'm with Cal Weaver. And it's continuing. But because the plot isn't linked directly to that one and won't be linked to the next, it's it's easier to do. I can sort of follow the course of their lives through upcoming books, but because it's not one huge arc, I can, you know, it's better that way. Right at the back. Which book could be adapted to a holiday movie? Or hol sorry? I mean, I've had a lot of the, like, a lot of the different books have been optioned for film. The first one that's actually getting made is the TV series in France. But um, it was mentioned Trust Your Eyes was a bidding war before, between Warner Brothers and Universal. Warner Brothers had it for two years. They had a director. They had a Todd Phillips who made the Hangover movies. He wanted to do a thriller instead of a comedy. So that was sort of looking good. Then that fell apart. And now the people who made Still Alice have it. They're seeing if they can make it into a movie. No Time for Goodbye. Eric McCormick of Will and Grace, he had he had no time for goodbye for four years. He desperately wanted to make it into a movie. He wrote the screenplay for it. And then that, for all various reasons, didn't happen. Um, so uh, like I say, a lot of, and, and No Time for Goodbye is now uh, likely gonna be made as a TV movie in France. I do, my books do really well in France, so there's a lot of interest there. So I think any number of them might work well as a film. Uh, an NBC option, never look away for a series at one point, and then that didn't happen. So, so whenever anybody says, uh, to me optioning, it's, this is an appropriate place to say this, I figured when they option a book, which means that for the next 18 months, no one else can make that book into a movie, and they've got it. To me optioning is like reserving a book at the library here and never picking it up. So I've stopped getting excited when I hear, well, somebody wants to option something, okay, you know, I mean, the chances, of it happening, I mean, when I, I, when I was in uh, California a couple years ago and I had lunch with the agent who represents my stuff, and he said, it's a miracle anything gets made. Like, really, he said, the hoops that every single production goes through to get to the point where it actually hits the screen, there's so many hurdles in the way 
that he said, he said, I'm amazed, trust your eyes, God, as far as it did. So we'll see. And you know what? It's, it's not, it, it, a lot of people think that's the be all and end all to get a movie made out of one of your books. And so many people I know who've had it happen are so depressed because it finally happened and they hated it. So, you know, if it happens, it happens. How are we doing for time? Two more questions. Yes? So what's Stephen King's secret? What is Stephen King's? Well, Stephen King's kind of, he's kind of up there, you know? I mean, what's his secret to getting movies made? He's kind of up there. I mean, everything of his would get optioned. And I, if any, I don't know if anybody's watching the uh, Super Channel's running it. It's Hulu in the States. They've done an adaptation of 112263, and it's fantastic. Like, it's so terrific. And it was all filmed around here, too, because we were watching it one night, and there was a scene at a butcher shop, and I went, that's the butcher shop on Clarkson Road in Mississauga that my parents always went to as a kid. Um, so it's, it's real. And I think 112263 is one of his best books. It amazes me that a guy who's been around and done that many, that many books isn't coasting. Like, he's still really turning out amazing stuff. So, but if anybody gets a chance to see that, it's really great. One more question. Yes. How do my books do in Quebec? I don't know. How do, I mean, they're in French. They get trans. They're translated. The French, my publisher in France has the rights to sell them there, um, but I honestly don't know how they do there. I would, I would hope wonderfully, but I. <laughs> but they're doing great in France, so that's okay. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm, I'm done. <laughs>